All right, this class is being recorded. <clears throat> uh, today is Wednesday, August 30th. This is the uh, section 401, 1230 section. Uh, today we're going to primarily go through lecture note one, uh, talk a little about homework one and teams, what we're going to do there. So before we get started, any questions from Monday or just general questions about anything? All right, so <clears throat> this class is using the seventh edition of the valuation book from McKinsey, and a lot of what we do is based on the work of McKinsey. Right? McKinsey's in a thousand boardrooms, and <clears throat> that book, Valuation, I told you is on a lot of people's desks, because what McKinsey's done a good job of is they've tried to figure out, you know, what of the academic literature relative to finance and valuation is applicable in the real world that, that drives value. Right? And <clears throat> one of the themes of our semester, based on the book, is called the Four Cornerstones of Valuation. I think it was a high-level overview of some of the topics that we're going to be going through. Right? But <clears throat> this is what really matters when it comes down to value creation. So the first cornerstone of valuation is something called spread. Okay? And the idea is, and you know this as finance people, it's the difference between internal rate of return, IRR, and R, okay? Meaning to have a positive NPV, you have to have an internal rate of return greater than your borrowing cost, your hurdle rate, okay? And the same is true in the real world. We just changed the terminology. ROIC is a one period IRR, okay? And cost capital, or WAC, is a one period R, all right? So the whole idea is my return invested capital has to be greater than my cost of capital over time, otherwise I can't have a positive NPV, I can't create value, okay? So again, it's just applying what we know in the textbooks in the real world, right? And the other reason why this matters is because those percentages are representations of cash flows. So if I have an ROIC of 10%, that means I'm generating 10 cents of cash per dollar of investment. If I have an ROIC of 20%, that means I'm generating 20 cents of cash per dollar of investment. Clearly, 20%, 20 cents is worth more than 10 cents over time. Okay? And the whole idea is the same thing. If my cost of capital is 8%, that means I had to pay back 8 cents per dollar of what I borrow. Okay? And so if I'm making an ROIC of 20%, 20 cents, and my cost of capital is 8%, 8 cents, 20 cents is a lot more than 8, I am creating value. Okay. As a matter of fact, that is going to be our definition for value creation, same in any finance course, is what we're going to call a positive spread. The difference between the ROIC and your cost of capital hurdle rate has to be positive. That is value creation because that's the only way over time that you get a positive net present value. Right? Does that kind of make sense to everybody? Okay. So, <clears throat> so that's the first point I want to make is that that is how we are going to judge things. Right? But two things come out of this. Number one, growth does not create value. Okay? And I'm going to say that one again. Growth does not create value. Right? And I'll give you an example. Let's say your cost of capital is 8% and your ROIC is 4%. If I'm borrowing at 8 and I make 4, I'm destroying value. And if I do more of that, I just get worse off. If I have a cost of capital of 8% and my ROIC is 14%, well, heck, I want to do that all day long. The more I do of it, the more value I create. Growth is the accelerant to value. It's like throwing gasoline on a fire. And what matters is the growth return combination when it comes to value creation, or more specifically, the growth spread combination, right? And there really is good growth, and there really is bad growth, all right? And we, as investors or even companies, have to be able to differentiate between the two, okay? So <clears throat> as an example of this, one of my favorite businesses, I was telling the, the last class, is a company called DoorDash, right? I like DoorDash, order things all the time from it, Grubhub, Uber Eats, very convenient. Matter of fact, uh, my favorite grocery store chain is Wegmans, <clears throat> and we order groceries from them all the time online. It's just convenient, because you're never home, 
it's there when you get there. You don't have to do the shopping yourself. Pay a little bit of a premium, but I like the convenience of it. All right. How financially are those companies doing? Is Uber Eats profitable? Is DoorDash profitable? Are all those companies? No. The average one of those companies, it costs them somewhere close to $1.40 or $1.50 for every dollar of revenue that comes in. Right? They are losing money on those deliveries. Yet these are extraordinarily valuable companies. They're publicly traded, IPO'd. Why would investors want to fund these very unprofitable companies? Because that's what they're doing. They're, they're literally giving them the money so that every time you call and you order a home delivery, it's costing them 50 cents for every dollar of home delivery. And the more you home deliver, the more money they're losing. And this is all being borrowed money from investors. Why would investors fund that negative growth? And so what's got to turn? What's the eventual got to turn? What's the eventuality? What does it have to turn to? A dollar of revenue versus cost. It's, it's going to have to cost us less than a dollar to deliver a dollar of groceries. We're going to have to start making money. That's the bet. So what I'll tell you is these are some of the most dangerous companies to own today because they're based on a belief that this will eventually turn positive spread. So investors will fund a positive spread either because, hey, I spend now expecting that it'll become positive spread later, or I just want it to be positive over time. But either way, I got to get to a positive spread. And what I'm telling you is right now, these companies are being funded based on a belief of a positive spread. But I'm telling you, if that belief goes away, you don't want to own any one of those companies because those stocks are going to fall very far, very fast because there is no long-term business model that says I can deliver stuff that costs me a dollar for a dollar fifty. Right? I have to get that cost down. And if I can't do that, it won't work. And what I was telling the last class is I'm getting pretty old. In the 90s, I lived in Atlanta. And my favorite company in Atlanta was a company called Webvan. You guys heard of Webvan before? The reason you haven't heard of it is they're gone. Right? Webvan was one of the most valuable startups of the time. They delivered groceries to your home in the 90s. It was great. I get home from work, I get on my Trio or my Blackberry, and or you can also go to your Netscape web browser and log in on AOL and basically order groceries from the grocery store and they would deliver it to your home at the same price as the food in the grocery store was. And they'd come in, they'd literally unpack it in your kitchen, put it on your counter. And it was great, you could buy anything, milk, eggs, bread, whatever. And it was very, very convenient. And then two years later, they went bankrupt because they spent, I forgot, it was like $50 billion. And they just couldn't make any money doing it, so they literally threw in the towel and they went away. Now, what's interesting is all these delivery companies are like Webband 2.0, right? And they're basically now using much more modern technology, but the same idea. And, and the whole idea was you can't just grow your way to scale. Like, if you just keep growing and losing money, investors aren't going to subsidize that forever. So you have to grow and eventually get a positive spread. So spread is going to be very important, not only for valuation, but how investors think, because that's what we're trying to get over time. Okay? So back to growth, got to have good growth. Growth for growth's sake is not going to be funded forever. There has to be an expectation that that growth will eventually turn positive. Otherwise, investors aren't going to fund that. Second point, 50% of that spread, 50% of your performance, is the industry. We said that on Monday. There's a lot of academic studies that say that. And one of the biggest proponents of that is Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, very famous investor, runs Berkshire Hathaway. He's 92 years old. He's sharing some of his wisdom about how he made money over time. And one of the things he said is, I don't invest in companies. I invest in industries. Because the industry is more important. If I fall in love with a company in a bad business, there's nothing they can do. All right? You can have a company in a great business and be average and still make a lot of money. So he says when he invests, he picks the industry first. Looks for an attractive industry, not just today, but over time. Okay? Then pick the company who's going to win in that order. And that has made him successful over time. Okay? And that needs to be our perspective. <clears throat> Meaning, I don't want to hope that I get an outlier in a bad business. Right? That's a hard way to pick stocks. 
right? I want to pick where I have a great industry. So even if I don't pick the best company, I still have a good chance of making money. I'd rather do that and then pick the outlier who's going to do well. Like that's just a better way of thinking about investment. And so that's what's going to matter. So first part is that's why we're going to do EICs. We have to think about how attractive is the industry today and over time. And again, half your performance of any company is going to be the industry. Now I can tell you this all day long, but it's easier to see it. And we have a tool that allows us to do this. So if you haven't, somebody asked me in the last class, they said, should we log into Bloomberg when we come into class? Default, yes. We're just going to be using it every class. Right? So, so back to this, logging into Bloomberg. So <clears throat> somebody give me any publicly traded company anywhere in the world. Publicly traded company. Shout one out. Tesla. Tesla. All right, so I'm going to look for Tesla. <coughs> and then there's a stock price quote for them, 259 up $2 today. But uh, the key here as you start to learn your Bloomberg certification is RV. RV, once you go to a company, stands for relative valuation. All right? It's basically real-time benchmarking. Okay? So when you hit RV, it's going to bring you to the screen that's going to have a default list of Tesla's peers. Right? Now, because this is a tool used by Wall Street, <clears throat> over here where it says comp source under Tesla, it's loading something called the BICS best fit algorithm first. Okay? BICS is the Bloomberg Industry Classification Service. And the algorithm is basically saying Bloomberg is using an algorithm of companies that it believes to be Tesla's closest peers. So this is kind of like the default peer list that Wall Street would see for Tesla. Now one of the nice features of Bloomberg is it will load the default list, but then you can customize this list to your heart's content. And if you don't like the Bloomberg list, which most people start with, then you can go and you can do a custom list if you want, or you can go down here to a GIX, Global Industry Classification Service list, or an SIC list like, there's lots of different ways to slice and dice, but for this semester, most of the time, we're going to be using the Bloomberg list because that's where the Wall Street people will start. Okay? Then over here, which says region, like, what region do I want to use? Now, right now, it's defaulting to global developed, but if I want to just look at Tesla's North American peers, hit local, and these would be just the U.S. peers of Tesla, obviously a smaller list, or I could look at, for example, the Asia-Pacific peers of Tesla or whatever. So again, just lots of, lots of ways to slice and dice. But this default list was BIX, algorithm, and I think it was global. All right, so these are all the big global automobile makers and both electric and traditional automobile makers. <clears throat> and it's got all these sub-tabs with default templates. Comp sheets, ESG markets, yada, yada. But the one I want to focus on for today is the one that says custom. And custom is a very powerful tab because it allows you to look up any metric you want on these companies, okay? Now, in order, your screen does not look like my screen by default, okay? And the reason why is your, everybody has a unique account and the default setting slightly different. So to make it look closer to mine, you go to settings once you've gone to this RV screen, global settings, and your screen, when you start, is going to look like this. And personally, it will, keep, it will have on it this middle menu bar section, which I find to be worthless, annoying, and it's not helpful. <laughs> so it just has random data that, that isn't what I'm looking for. So I just want it out of my way, because it just takes up screen real estate, and I'd rather look at the data that I want to see. So I get rid of this middle section. I've never used any of the data that Bloomberg throws in this middle section. Okay. So in order to get rid of this middle section, settings, global settings, uncheck show top section. And then it will go away when you hit close. So that's the difference between your screen and my screen. Okay. Now you want to keep that menu bar there? Feel free. Everybody you know, has their own preferences. But I, I just find it just gets in the way. Second thing is, it'll give you the list of companies. Back to settings, global settings. Second option I want you to check is down here, it says stats. 
it's got stats. I can do a minimum, maximum, sum, average, median of all the companies on this list. The one that we want to have by default is the market cap weighted average. Check that box. Hit close. And then what's going to happen is the very first row, anytime you load this screen, is going to be the market cap weighted average of whatever's in that column. All right? And the reason why we're going to do that is because this is the only tool out there that allows you to do real-time industry averages. And so this is basically going to be an industry average because the average of all the companies in the industry. But we're going to use the market cap weighted average because I don't want to have a teeny tiny company distorting the average. So it's adjusted for size. All right? So next, see where it says add column? This is where you can look up your data points. So the data point I want to add is ROIC. So I start typing in ROIC, and it shows me a bunch of matches, and the very first one down says return to invested capital. That's the ROIC. So I'm going to select that. And then a second pop-up box is going to come up and say, which ROIC do you want? Do you want the one from the latest filing, which would be, at this point, second quarter 2023, average annual 12 months for, before that? Do you want the latest quarter? Do you want the latest year, so through 2022? Do you want to do a customized period, like three years ago? Like, which ROIC do you want? Right? We're going to choose latest filing. And then we're going to hit enter or go. And what that's going to do is it's going to put a column in there with the ROIC LF, latest filing, the market cap weighted average, the average of every company on this list. It's a scrollable list. Which last year through the second quarter 2023 was, so this is most current release data, 13.86. That's the industry average. And Tesla, which is the first row down, is 22.1. And then each of the companies fell. Second column I want you to add is called the WAC. WACC. The weighted average cost of capital. Select that. It doesn't give you an option to choose a historical WAC, it just does a current WAC in the RV screen. Okay. So this is the current WAC, and this is the ROIC of the latest filing. Okay. And this goes back to one last thing. We're going to be using this template a lot. And by the way, this is the template that you'll be turning in for homework one. Okay. So I want to save this as a reusable template. So every time I come to the screen, I don't have to rebuild it. I could just click on a button, and it just populates the data in this format. Okay. So in order to do that, you see this little gear icon? You click on this little gear icon, save as new template. Call it whatever you want, right? So I'm going to call mine the 443 spread template. Now, I created this template in the last class, so I'm going to overwrite it. But when you create the new template, this bar right here next to create template will be blank for you. This bar right here is blank for you, but as you create and save templates, they'll start popping up on here. So these are just one-click templates for specific formats. So for example, I have created over time more, a bunch of templates. So if I wanted to look at like bank KPIs applied to Tesla, wouldn't really make sense, but I, I have a bank KPI template. So I have a you know ROIC margin template. I have a thing I did for Deloitte, a Deloitte template. So basically, you can create all sorts of templates, very convenient, but and it'll be individual to your account. But the one we want is the spread template and this is going back to when I load the screen later and I click on my spread template, which I've just saved, it will then reapply that template automatically with the data populated for the company as peers. Okay. Now, let's talk about value creation. Going back to net present value, we only create value when we have a positive spread, when the ROIC is greater than the cost of capital. So, as, as an industry, that button There's. is this an attractive value creating industry is this a value creating industry yes sir i'm sorry yeah. why okay so here's the deal he is correct. 
But based on what I told you on Monday, he would get a zero on his assignment. Why? Say it again then. So, Good practice. So the RIC is uh, the, weight, the weighted average is 16.68%. Yeah. And then the cost of capital is 14.6%. Okay, your numbers are different than my numbers. Yeah. There's like way less comfort. Yeah, yeah. So it depends on, it goes back to what's your comp source. Because if you use a different comp source that I'm using, you're going to do, get a different group of companies and you're going to get a different. Um, answer. Okay. I'm sorry. I know. So for ComSource, does it say best fit algorithm? And for region, does it say global? And does it say whole firm? I don't know why. Uh, does it say market cap of 200 million? Great, 200 million. Let me just see if you have a default setting that's different than mine. <coughs> Do you have under comparables, under global settings, max number of comps, 50? Go to global settings, second tab, comparables. Down here at the bottom, does it say max number of global comps, 50? No, I think it says 10. Change that to 50. Wait, where is it? It's under settings, global settings. So let's start again. Go to settings, global settings, comparables, and the max number comes 50. Because if, if you have 10 in there by default, it's just going to take the 10 biggest firms and it's going to stop. Right? And then I'd like to get the whole industry, so I'm putting in 50. That's why we have a difference in numbers. But given the difference in numbers, I'm, what you said was correct the second time. And that's what you would need to say for your write ups and your papers. So good job the second time around. Right? But that's going to be very important. That's why it's important to use numbers. Matter of fact, here's the point. Listen to when I ask this question. Close your eyes one time. Do this even when your team presentation is getting prepped. Close your eyes and listen to what they say when they answer the question. Because when he says this, looking at the screen, it has a positive spread because it's, it's higher than its cost of capital. Who's he talking about? Like, what are you talking about? How do I know? I can't see the numbers. I don't know what you're talking about. That's the problem when you make presentations. And I'll give you a real world reason why I'm tough on you guys. In the real world, and I talk to companies all the time and very senior leaders all the time, when you throw your PowerPoint up there, when you throw a spreadsheet up there, when you throw a screen like this up there, you know what you're looking at, but nobody in the room does. And so what's obvious to you is not necessarily obvious to them. And they're like, look at the screen like, I don't know what he's talking about. So that's why numbers are very helpful. Because if I use the numbers, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And for people that are not familiar with your data, it helps them hone in. So it actually helps your credibility. It re really does. But more importantly in this class, if you don't use numbers, I'm not giving you credit because I don't know what you're talking about if you don't use numbers. And you might be looking at the wrong thing. And so if you use numbers, I know what you're looking at. So we have to use numbers in this class. That being said, he was correct. So this is an attractive industry. Now, the second definition I want to give out of this because the ROIC is greater than the WAC for the first line market cap weight average. Yes, sir. That's a quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of a look at the end. But when it comes to using numbers, would you have to say, like, okay, the, the, the ROIC is this and the WAC is this, or could you just say what the spread is? So in the first time we grade your assignments, they'll be worth two points. If you say the spread in this industry is about 1%, you'll get a one out of two. Okay. If you say the ROIC is higher than the WAC, you'll get a zero out of two. And if you say the ROIC is 13.86, which is 12, and the WAG is 12.81, which is a spread of about 1%, and that's why it's a value creating industry, you'll get two out of two. That's what I need you to write down. That's the, what I need you to get in the practice on. And, and, and by the way, it'll just become second nature in a couple of weeks, but I'm just telling you, that will make you better. Even in interviews, when you start talking that way, like it'll add to your credibility, because it'll show that you really know what you're talking about, as opposed to people that are BSing their research. All right, back to this. Second definition I want to give you is competitive advantage. Okay? In the marketing classes and the strategy classes, everybody's good at everything. Everybody's got a competitive advantage. You know, we don't have things, people that are better. We don't have winners anymore. No, that's not this class. All right? In the real world, you have competitive advantage. You're outperforming your peers. 
that's competitive advantage. All right? If you're not outperforming your peers, you don't have competitive advantage. All right? So that's the point. I was telling the last class, this is on video, so it's kind of a dangerous comment. I hope I don't go past the line and get in trouble. But you are probably at one of the top 40, top 50 schools in the world, and probably one of the top 25 to 50 finance programs in the world. So if you're in this room, you're smart, unless a horrible mistake was made. Right? You are smart. You wouldn't be here. Which means you're, you're actually pretty good just to be in this classroom at what you do. But by definition, half the people in this room are below average. Now, I'm not stupid enough at this school to identify a below average student, but that's the point. Like, think about the grades. You get an A, everybody gets a B. If you get A's, everybody else gets B's, you're above average consistently. That's why we have grades, okay? And that's the point about competitive advantage. Like, this, if you're in an attractive industry, okay, the reason you're making money might not be that you're good, it's just you're in a good place. So if you're really better than your peers, you outperform your peers. So the definition that we are going to use for competitive advantage is relative performance against peers. In specific case, higher spread than peers. So your spread better be better than the average of the industry if you have competitive advantage. Otherwise, you're just in a good place. So with that definition, does Tesla demonstrate competitive advantage in this slight value creating industry? Does Tesla create competitive advantage? Do they demonstrate that financially? Yes or no, and how do you know? There you go, A plus answer. That, that's exactly how I want you to be thinking about this. Tesla is demonstrating competitive advantage and creating value. Does that make sense? Okay, so give me another company and another industry. Yep. TSMC. TSMC. I will go to Taiwan for this one. All right, I'm going to 2330 TT equity. I'm not looking at their ADR. So <clears throat> this is one of the biggest custom chip manufacturers in the world. When you buy your iPhone, they make the chips in your iPhone. Okay. So somebody had a hand back there, question? Is there a way to actually certify an industry or do you just have to find something? I haven't found an easy way to do what we're doing by industry. There's ways to do industry, but it's usually based on like performance of the stock as opposed to the individual metrics. This is your benchmarking screen. All right, so back to this. Notice that the industry average has changed <coughs> and the list of companies and peers of uh, TF, TS, was it TSMC, sorry. TSMC have now changed. All right, is this an attractive industry? Is this an attractive value creating industry based on this data? I see some nodding heads. I'd like to hear some verbal. Why is this an attractive industry? Somebody else. Yes, sir. All right, you have a slightly different mix that I must, if you have slightly different numbers. Could you read the numbers on my screen? Are, are your eyes that good? Using the numbers that are on my screen, what does this attractive industry? Somebody can read these numbers, give me the answer. All right, you can read the numbers, go ahead. All right. All right, so it's an attractive industry. She had the right numbers, and she used the reason why. Here's the follow-up question. Does this company that we're looking at, first row down, do they have competitive advantage? Does TSMC, TMSC, TSMC, do they have competitive advantage? Again, you're going to get partial credit. 
because Yeah, their spread 24.52 minus 15.31 is about nine points. And the industry spread 33 minus 14 is 19 points. And, and so basically, even though they create value, they're not creating as much value as the industry. And therefore, yes, they're value creating, but they're not demonstrating competitive advantage. That's, that's the way we would interpret this. Does that make sense to everybody in this class? Yes? Um, would that mean that the yeah, they are below average in their industry. Matter of fact, what I can do, if I click on ROIC as an example, I can default filter a column and see like who is doing pretty well. And one of the company is a company called ASML Holdings, <coughs> which has a almost 60% ROIC against a 17% WAC. Uh, KLA, 41%. Applied Materials, 33%. So there's a lot of companies that are doing better on an ROIC perspective than they are. And that's the, the point. So they're driving, and they're bigger companies, which are driving the industry to look more attractive. So it's not saying they're not a bad company. They're still creating a lot of value. It's just they're doing a little less well in a really, really good industry. That's the way we should be perspective today. Does that make sense? So <laughs> real quick, and in, in the interest of this one conversation, I'm going to waive the requirement to use numbers temporarily. Does ASML have competitive advantage? Yes or no? ASML, yeah. row 102. Does Global Unichip Corp, row 103, do they have competitive advantage? Does KLA have competitive advantage? Can more than one company have competitive advantage? Yes, they can. That's the other point I want you to understand. It's not like, like King of the Hill where I'm the only company that has competitive advantage, more than one can have competitive advantage. Here's the other thing that got asked in the last class. Let's say we're having an industry that has a negative spread, an industry that is destroying value. Can a company in an industry that's destroying value have competitive advantage? Yes, they can. How? It's not that they have a positive spread. Yeah. It's exactly. If it's less negative than the industry average, using our definition, that would still be competitive advantage. Meaning, the industry could suck, I just suck less. That means I'm better at less sucking than you who suck more. Okay. So, so that's the perspective we're going to use. It's relative performance for competitive advantage. It's absolute performance for industry attractiveness. Everyone would be on that? Okay. So let's see if we can find an industry that sucks. What would be an industry that sucks? I'm going to give you one. You actually showed it to me. It's called Tesla. <laughs> and here's why. If I go back to Tesla, <clears throat> the industry that we looked at for Tesla had a slight positive spread. Let's take a second load of data. 13.86 against 12.81. But here's the point. Tesla, as a gigantic market cap, we're earning 22%, is weighting the industry average. If I rank based on ROICs, a couple companies are doing really well, but as I scroll down this list, there's a lot of companies that aren't doing so well. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take Tesla off this list. And ironically, for whatever reason, just I've used Bloomberg before, Ford does not have Tesla as a default competitor. Okay, Wall Street just doesn't look at Tesla as Ford's default competitor. Although today, Ford just announced that they're dropping their final uh, passenger vehicles and making them all electric. Okay, But that being said, here is Ford's Peerless. So this is basically traditional <laughs> automobile makers. So Ford, GM, Stellantis, BMW, Toyota, Hyundai, Kia, et cetera. Okay, so <clears throat> this is the traditional automobile industry today. Is this an attractive industry? All right, the requirement has now been reactivated. Is this an attractive industry? Go ahead. Six percent below 
So this is actually a, a really tough industry right now. And, and that would be the point. Okay. So everybody see that? So this is, by, by the way, we're going to get to EIC coming soon. Like why? What makes this industry so tough? Why aren't these companies doing well? As a group, they all, almost all of them have negative spreads. In fact, if I sort by ROIC, there's only two companies in the entire industry that have a positive spread. Ferrari and Kia. So if you sell like, you know, exotic, ultra expensive sports cars, okay, you can make money, right? And I don't even know what Kia does. They sell boxes, right? So if they sell you a box or a very expensive sports car, you can make money. Outside of that, no one else is really creating any value in this industry. Why? What makes this industry so tough? Yeah. So how does that play to selling cars? Because that's what they do. Uh, so the thing is rising gas prices, people are going to buy like, gas vehicles. Like this, so and if they're not going to buy gas vehicles, they're going to buy electric yeah, electrics or hybrids. So this industry is in the middle of a transition to hybrids and electric future. That was the point I just made. Ford just stopped selling passenger cars that are gas. They're going to all electric cars for passenger cars. So the problem is we haven't bought these cars yet. Right? So we are spending, as industry, billions and billions of dollars to, to basically build this sustainable car future, but the sales aren't there yet. So we have huge I, but not much S&P. Okay? So we don't have the sales and profits to justify the investment. And so that's the problem with the industry right now, is that all these companies are spending money for cars that you haven't bought yet. Right? And by the way, personal story, I don't think you're buying them anytime soon, and in mass, and here's why. So I do a lot of consulting outside of this for companies. And last year, I was I told this class in the last class, it's, it's almost the same story. I was doing some work in Silicon Valley for a company in Cupertino. And <clears throat> I brought my girlfriend along with me because she always gets mad when I leave town and go to these places she can't go. And then we were going to stay the weekend after my consulting gig and we we're going to go to Napa Valley. And I decided to rent a Tesla because I wanted to kind of see what they were all about. Maybe we consider buying one. And we just drive it to Napa Valley, enjoy it while we're in Silicon Valley. I have to tell you, it was a horrible experience. Mm -hmm. We were frightened the entire time of running out of electricity because in Cupertino, at the Apple spaceship, at the visitor center, they have two chargers, two, and they were full. And when people charge their cars, they walk away. You have no idea when they're gonna come back. So how do you charge your car if you're running low on electricity? And then we went to Napa Valley, the same thing. We're in California. California should probably be one of the most electric car friendly places in the world. Every car place was full. We couldn't find car chargers that were open. And, and like I said, even at our hotel, they were parked, three of them on front of our hotel, overnight, locked up. Where do we charge our car? And, and we were paranoid. Like, how do we charge our car? Where do we go? And I'm like, I can't buy a car where I'm doing this. And then, so yeah, maybe if you drive it at home and you just go to the grocery store and back. But if you're driving longer distances, or like, say you're going from here to Orlando to Disney World with the kids with an electric car, we're going to charge along the way. And that's the other thing. When you charge, it doesn't take like five minutes to charge. It took like two hours to charge when we found a charger because we couldn't find a Tesla supercharger. And that was the other thing. If we didn't turn it back 70% full of electricity, Hertz charged you 40 bucks. So at the Tesla supercharger, charging a Tesla, it cost more than $40 to charge the damn thing. I thought one of the whole arguments of electric cars is it's supposed to be cheaper than gas cars. It was actually more expensive. So I'm just telling you, yes, electric cars may be our future, but you're going to have a lot of people like me who are just like, not yet. We do not have the infrastructure for these electric cars. And I think that's what you're seeing with some of these automobile makers. Because back to my girlfriend, this year she's looking to buy a car. So first she went to the Honda dealer. And she, went, she was looking at the CRV. They had one CRV on the lot. That was it. And the lot was completely empty. And they're like, that's the CRV we will sell you. Can we test drive it? No, because that's our only CRV. We're not going to let you test drive it. But we've got four other people interested in it, so if you want to bid for it, you can have it. And we don't know when any more are coming in. That's the other problem these automobile makers would have. They were having supply chain disruptions, which are still coming out of COVID. And because of that, they can't sell you cars that they don't have. And that's been hurting their ROIC. Now that's starting to resolve itself right now, but the other thing is that she wanted a Mercedes, so she went over to the Mercedes dealer, 
the Mercedes people were pushing their electric SUV, and they had like 20 of them on the lot. And they were offering us five to $7,000 discounts in every car, because they can't give the damn things away, because people like me don't want to buy them because we're worried about how we're going to charge them. Okay? It's not that we're cool cars, it's just the infrastructure's not ready. That's what this industry is facing in transition. So yes, maybe electric cars are our future, but the, the on-ramp to that future is gonna be a little bumpy. With one exception of Tesla. Tesla, that cult seems to be doing pretty well. <clears throat> but other than that, the, it's a tough industry. Yes, sir. If one of the companies on this list uh, started selling like way more electric cars, would they then be moved to the same list that Tesla's on? Abs I mean, as I said, they can also be moved because you go to this little icon, you click it, and then you just add Tesla to the list. And then voila, Tesla is on your list. <laughs> so it's really easy. I'm just telling you, this is like a default list that Bloomberg gives based on talking to the analysts, but you can also choose different ways to, to look at yourself. So I'm not saying every analyst doesn't look at Ford. I just know the default list for Ford didn't have Tesla. Right. Back to this, give me somebody else. A company? Yeah. Draft Who? Draft Kings. Draft Kings. Are they public? All right, DraftKings. Let's look at sports betting. And then again, to get back here, RV. And again, I'm going to use the default list, which is the best fit algo. And custom. And then back to, if you're coming back here, spread. There's my template. So since you asked for DraftKings, you tell me when the data loads, is DraftKings in an attractive value creating industry? Um, <clears throat> yeah, they are because for the way that average um, RFC was negative 1.54, which obviously is not good, but the WAC was 9.02. And you're saying that's attractive? No, you said? Positive spread from the RFC to WAC. No, I'm asking, is this an attractive industry? Oh, the industry, no. It's a terrible industry yeah, right now. Yeah. Does DraftKings demonstrate competitive advantage? Um, no. Clearly not, because they have a negative 43% yeah. ROIC in a terrible industry. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, like, where it says full time, since we're, like, looking at specific industries, like, mm -hmm. are we supposed to just pick one at a time, or, like, we just do, like, general Well, great question, and I'll say soon. I I'm trying to baby step you guys into this thing. This is why you need to get certified. But like, good question you brought up. So if you click on whole firm, you'll notice two sub industries. So if I choose the casino and gaming peers, this will be a different list and a different industry return than if I choose, sorry to delay here, that list and that industry versus application software peers that are making software for the online betting, that industry is probably gonna have a slightly different spread than the people that are more of the casinos, online casinos, gaming companies. <clears throat> Actually, no, it's worse, it's worse. But the, the point is, you can have different peer lists that are parts of your business. This will get back to when we talked about multiples. One of the problems with multiples and comparables is finding true comparisons, because companies do multiple things and when you're comparing them, you start comparing them and get different peers, even though you don't do everything the same parts of your business do. But that's later in the semester. Right now, we'll just keep whole firm, for, keep it simple, All right? But what I wanted to show you, as we went industry by industry, is the idea that different industries had different spreads. If you were paying attention, different industries have different wax, right? Different industries had different levels of performance, right? And that's the message I, I want to underline, put an exclamation point on. Last one here is airlines, Delta Airlines. So let's say we're doing the airlines. How do you think the airlines are going to look? Not good? Still tough times coming out of COVID? Yeah. We'll give you another feature. This gets back to EIC. 25% of an airline's cost is fuel. And so it's all about fuel costs, and it's all about passenger volume. Right. Now, right now, if I look at U.S. airlines, major U.S. airlines, Delta's peers, slightly value-creating industry, ROIC of 9, WAC of 7.73. Delta is really the king of the airline industry right now. They're making 10 <laughs> against a WAC slightly higher at 8.26.
their spread of about two points is slightly higher than the industry average spread of about 1.2 points, which means that it's a slightly value creating industry and Delta is exhibiting a little bit of competitive advantage. That's the way you, you look at this, right? But here's what's interesting. This is the last 12 months going through the second quarter. If I were to come over to this gear icon and if I add a column and the column that I'm going to add is ROIC, but instead I'm going to go to a customized period and I'm going to go to years ago minus two. Two years ago, I think 2020, those were the ROICs, right? And, and this is what I also mean by industry. Like, it didn't matter who you were in 2020 when COVID kind of shut down travel and people weren't really flying anywhere. There's no airline that's going to overcome that. And you could see the terrible performance that the airlines had. Now, travel's coming back. Planes are starting to fill up again. And as a result of that, basically, they're starting to make money again. Spreads look a lot different than they did at that time. We need to understand the difference in the industry dynamics that will explain the spread. That's what EIC is eventually going to be about. But we can start to see it here in the data. But the part of this conversation that started with half your performance is the industry. Different industries have different levels of return. And we need to just understand that and what explains that. Ever with me? Here's your homework assignment. Homework one is pretty easy. Right? Homework one is to create this template and to find an industry that currently has a negative spread. Take a screenshot of that industry with a negative spread. I don't know how you could possibly find one. It's so hard, all right? But, and then submit it, and that's it. Two easy points. You could probably do it right now. So here's the last thing I'll show you. How do you do that screenshot? In Bloomberg, in the upper right-hand corner, there's this little box with an arrow coming out of it called the export box. Upper right-hand corner of your Bloomberg terminal. You click on the export box. A couple options. Option one, take a screenshot. You can then email the screenshot to yourself. You can save the screenshot, which is what I usually do as a, do as a GIF file. It'll say name it, okay? And my file name, I usually do, for your purposes, I'll do the ticker, and then I'll do the screen. This is the RV screen, which I had done in the previous class. But when I post files online, examples. See, so, you know, this is the company, this was the screen in Bloomberg I got it from. You, don't, you can use whatever you want for your screenshots, but you need to save a screenshot of an industry that has a negative spread, okay? Using the, the template we just built. And the other thing is you can come on here, you can print and you can snip part of a screen if you want as well, all within Bloomberg. So yes, you can also take a screenshot in Windows. I don't even remember how to do it, but it's much easier to do it. And by the way, this is the screenshot down here that we just took. And that's what you would upload and submit for your file. Now remember, if you're saving it to one of these machines, it's going to get wiped out over the weekend when you, as soon as you control off delete and log out of the machine. So make sure you put it on a thumb drive and take it with you. Okay? All right, questions about that? Yes. Find an industry that has a negative spread. It's not like we went through any of them today. But yes, you could tr try search around other companies and industries. Yes? Yes. So let me, let me address that one. It is really, really important that you do the work yourself this semester. All right? And it's not just the academic side, but it is the academic side. But it's also important because if you don't use Bloomberg yourself and you have other people doing it for you, you're not going to learn how to use the software. You're not going to learn how to do these assignments. You're not going to understand anything. So you have to do this yourself. So therefore, there's no sharing of screenshots. All right, you can't have one person do the screenshot, send it to your 10 friends, and they all upload the homework assignment. That kind of defeats the purpose of the homework assignment. The whole homework assignment is you yourself figured out how to use the software, figured out how to apply this, and did it. That's why you can't share screenshots. At the bottom of every screenshot you take in Bloomberg is a serial number. You might say, well, gee, if I'm using the same terminal because we're sharing, two people are going to have the same serial number. Yes. But also, right next to that serial number is a timestamp. And you're not going to have the same timestamp with that serial number as somebody else unless you're using that file that's exactly the same as somebody else. So if we find the same serial number and timestamp, 
it's an easy layup with academic integrity going to the honor council, right? And I will enforce that, not because I want to send you to the honor council, because I'm just pleading with you, like, if you're going to take this class, this goes back to my soapbox on Monday, do the work. If you really don't want to do the work, you want other people to do it for you, take another class. Like, we got too many people in this room already. I had a, a poor student who's like, I couldn't see what you're doing in the terminal because I couldn't actually get to the terminal where you were doing this. Will you please record the later class because I, I was trying to follow along and I'm watching somebody else do it. Like, that pains me. I'd love for everybody to have their own terminal, right? But if you don't have it, at least do the damn work. Don't just lollygag and have somebody else do your work, right? That's, that's not fair to you. It's not fair to everybody else. But anyways, so that's your answer, All right? By the way, that's homework one. That's an easy homework one. You can do it now, upload it, oh, that screenshot, and then you're done. See you next Wednesday. Yes. Sorry, what? Absolutely. Or you use a different one, it's up to you. Visiting a negative spread. Yes. Hold on, hold on, one at a time. I would prefer that you change your global settings to 15 just because of what happened to him. Because as you go through the semester, it's going to always default to 10, and you probably won't get the whole list. Yes, sir. I do company dash RV for screen. Company dash whatever. All right. Yes, ma'am. It doesn't have to be the exact same list. For this assignment, I just need a market cap weighted average that is ROIC less than the WAC. That's what the TAs are going to check for. All right, we're not done. We've got to keep going. So back to the four cornerstones. Second cornerstone. It's about cash flow, not income. Okay? So all the academic data says that companies are worth the sum of their future cash flows. My metaphor is this. Income is like a pay stub. It tells you how much cash you were paid on a particular day, but it doesn't tell you how much cash you have on your account today. And time value of money matters. Like it's not just that we're going to get the cash, it's when we get the cash changes its value. We know that as finance people. So therefore, over time, we track the cash flow, not the income even though income will represent what that cash will eventually be because timing differences matter, okay? So value is much more based on cash flows. And so that's our approach, is we're gonna constantly be trying to get to cash flows. ROIC is proxy for cash flow, okay? It's not ideal, but it's a proxy, right? That's why we discount it, right? But number two, it's income, or sorry, cash flow, not income. The second cornerstone. Cornerstone number three, I tricked you. I told the last class. I lived in Philly for nine years. At the time, two of my favorite up-and-coming magicians were Penn and Teller. In fact, they got a great TV show, I think, called Fool Us, where magicians go in to see if they can fool them to perform at their now Las Vegas show. But like any great magician, I just performed a magic trick on you. All that data we've been looking at for the 30 minutes, those industries, what data were we looking at? What have we been looking at? All these spreads. I'll ask, ask the user coach. When did this data come from? This is accounting. All this is last year. Valuation is about the future. It's not about the past. And I told you on Monday that people like to keep score. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. We were scorekeeping. We were making judgments about industries and companies, good or bad, based on what happened last year. And what I'm telling you is yes, that's what they did last year, but what's more important to their value is what's gonna do next year. Think back to the airlines. Airlines lost money in 2020, who cares? Airlines are kind of breaking even slightly positive spread this year, but what are they gonna do next year? If airlines keep getting better and the planes get fuller and fuller and they make lots more money and they keep raising their prices, I don't care what they did last year. I'm more interested in what's going to happen in the future. So value is based on the future cash flows, not on the historical cash flows. And this gets back to the University of Chicago. Right? All your textbooks, everything you learn is from Chicago. Okay? 
And <clears throat> the idea is back in the 70s, they, they did a lot of groundbreaking research on corporate finance. And one of the things they did that won a bunch of Nobel Prizes is they looked at big data sets of all different types of investments over 50 years. And they basically took stocks, bonds, real estate, and said, what were the cash flows? What were the prices of these assets over time? And over time, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between cash and price. Whatever cash you generated eventually became your price. Okay? By the way, they've updated that data through today, last 100 years, and nothing has changed. Okay? Eventually, cash equals price. Right? But here's the rub. Today, I guess what the cash flows are going to be. Right? Eventually, I see what the cash flows are, I adjust to the price. So Warren Buffett has a good way of explaining this. He says, in the short term, stock prices are like a voting machine. In the long term, stock prices are like a weighing machine. Today, I guess what the cash flows are going to be. Eventually, your price will adjust to what the cash flows are, because I get whatever cash you generate. That's intrinsic value. Okay? So that's what the expectation cornerstone is about. What are the future cash flows are? Because those are going to lead to your price, not your historical cash flows. So it's all about the future. Right? Now, by the way, two things come out of this. Even if we could jump into a time machine, the first 10 years of a company are probably the most important to predict their cash flows in terms of their value, just because of present value. Right? So what are the cash flows of Delta Airlines for the next 10 years? Right? If I know those, I have a good idea what their value should be. But the problem is, I guess what the 10 years are, over 10 years I'll adjust to the actual, but we never get to that future. Because if I go 10 years in the future, the last 10 years of Delta won't matter anymore. It's always the next 10 years. So even if I jump 10 years into the future, it's what is Delta going to do 10 years thereafter? That's what's going to drive their price. So I'm going to give you an always in finance. Price is always expectation. The price of any company is always its expected cash flows. It's never its actual cash flows because we'll never get to the actual cash flows. That's why the expectation cornerstone gets really, really important. All right. So on Wall Street, there are two people that are very important to guessing future cash flows. One is called the buy side, and the other is called the sell side. Does anybody know the difference between the two? So if I say buy side, who am I talking about on Wall Street? What's the buy side? Hedge funds, private equity. Hedge funds, private equity. Private equity. What does that mean? What does the buy side mean? They're the ones investing the money. Yeah. It, they're the ones investing the money. They're literally buying the stocks that they're going to hopefully earn a return on. Okay? That's called the buy side. Okay? So in Bloomberg, you can see the buy side. So let's say I'm at Delta Airlines, and then I type in command line HDS. HDS stands for security owners, it's the holders. This is the buy side. These are the people that actually own Delta stock. And specifically, it's the institutional shareholders. Bloomberg tracks that. So as of today, 74.43% of Delta shareholders are on this scrollable list. All right? And that's pretty common. Matter of fact, actually it's low for the S&P 500. Most companies are not owned by Robinhood who owns the, the people on Robin who buy like three shares of Delta, right? It's these institutions, Vanguard, which owns 72.4 million shares of Delta and controls 11% of their stock, okay? That's Delta's largest shareholder. And this is a scrollable list, but their biggest shareholder is Vanguard, which owns 72 million shares, Capital Group, which owns 47 million shares, BlackRock, which owns 40 million shares, Prime Cap, State Street, FMR, their sixth largest shareholder, that's Fidelity. Okay. Delta's six top shareholders, if you add up these percentages of ownership of those shares, those top six shareholders represent 34% of all of Delta stock. These people are very critical to Delta Airlines because back to what are they doing? When Capital Group buys almost 17 million of their shares or Vanguard sells 870,000 shares, they set the price, All right? As I said, it's not somebody who buys 100 shares. That doesn't affect the company stock prices anymore. It's the people that are trading the big blocks, the buy side are trading the big blocks, they are the price setters for companies. They are basically people who used to be in this class, right? You go as a finance major, you're hired, 
to work for one of these funds at BlackRock, you're on teams that are buying and selling stock, applying the principles you learned in business school. So everything we're talking about is the way that Wall Street actually analyzes and evaluates stocks, right? So this is called the buy side, and it's very important to a company's stock price. Matter of fact, when a company releases earnings, there are two calls. The first call is the public call with the analysts asking the questions. The second call, which is a private call, is with their owners. And that's the more important call. Because I'm going to have probably 30 of my largest shareholders on a conference call with my quarterly earnings. And they're the ones that are going to be buying or selling the stock based on that call. So that buy side call is actually even more important than the sell side call. And companies will have that one too. Okay? Now, back to this. Let's say that I work for BlackRock. I went through this class and I get a job at BlackRock. Okay? And let's say I'm working for an active fund at BlackRock, which means I'm actually picking stocks that I think are going to win, okay? following Warren Buffett's principles, for example. Now, I'm going to be forced to have a diversified portfolio. I can't just bet it all in one company. So I might have 50, 100 companies in my portfolio, and they're going to be in different industries. So the question is, how do I, my team at BlackRock, keep track of all the companies in all the industries and all their competitors in all their markets on a daily basis? Because if I do the airlines, I got to track all the global airlines. And oh, by the way, they're tied to fuel, which means I got to track what's going on with fuel prices. There's another team, I own Exxon, what's going on in the oil and gas industry. And then I might own a car company like Toyota. So how do I track all what's going on in the the automobile industry. That's a lot of work for my team, and I just named three companies. I got a bunch more in my portfolio. So there's too much going on for them to keep track of it. So here's what they do. Wall Street then spends $4 billion a year to another group of people called the sell side, who are specialists, they're consigliere, to tell them what to do with individual stocks. So I'm paying somebody else to say, what should I do with Toyota? What should I do with Delta Airlines? That's called the sell side. And for Delta, it's these people. A N R. Okay? By the way, that last screen, holders, is one of the most valuable screens in Bloomberg. It's where investor relations of companies live. Investor relations with companies live on this screen, HDS, every day. Matter of fact, I work with a lot of companies. The head of investor relations will go to the CFO every day with a list printed out of these companies because you don't want some activist investors showing up on this list. And you'll see it on this list sometimes, even before it's announced publicly, they started buying up some of your stock. So you want to know who these owners are, and you want to also make sure they don't sell out. By the way, you can look at historical ownership of these funds, and this tab is matrix, which means you can look at, does Vanguard own Delta? Who else in my peer list does Vanguard also own, and how much holdings do they have in that list? Again, this is actually considered one of the most valuable pieces of Bloomberg real estate. All right? That's called holders, HDS. Second screen that matters, as I said, is ANR. This is the sell side. Okay? And here's the idea of the sell side. All right? The sell side doesn't own your stock. But they are being paid by the buy side to tell them what to do with the stock. Okay? So, Back to this. Who is the sell side? It is these 21 people from Delta. It's Helene Becker of Cowan. It's David Vernon of Bernstein. Catherine O'Brien of Goldman Sachs. Stephen Trent City. Ravi Shankar, Morgan Stanley, yada, yada. Okay? Now, <clears throat> these sell siders, the sell side team, typically three people. Okay? They're all specialists, in this case, in the airline industry. It'll be the lead analyst. It'll be an MBA in finance, and it'll be an M undergrad in finance, and that's typically a team. They might even have a couple of interns, right? But if you're trying to get a job on Wall Street, this is one of the paths, is to become a sell-side research team coming out of business school. You start out as an intern or an undergrad, and they will hire for this, right? By the way, and, and I'll just give you an off-the-record comment, if you're so inclined, I had a student last semester who emailed me and said, still can't find a job, tough job market out there, right? He's like, do you have any suggestions? And so the suggestion is, you know, are you willing to accept rejection? This database of Bloomberg has 340,000 people in it of the actual people that work on Wall Street using a system of record, which if you contact them, likely the first time you contact them, they will respond. 
So for example, if I were to click on, I don't know, let's say I want to work at David Bernstein and Bernstein, this is his bio at Bernstein. In his bio is his actual phone number, his email address at Bernstein, and his, his actual physical address in New York City. Now, I wouldn't show up physically at his office and look like a stalker, but that green dot means that David is actually on Bloomberg right now, and we can IM him. And because this is a system of record, he's going to respond to that IM. Right? Now, he might block you when he realizes you're a student looking for a job, but hey, how tough is your skin? You want to work on Wall Street? You want to path in? You have the contact information of everyone in the world on their financial institutions. You want to work in Tokyo? You want to work in Hong Kong? P-E-O-P, P -E -O -P, P It is a searchable list. You can search by firm. You can search for all the Maryland students that work at these firms. You can search a lot of different ways, and you have the contact information for every single one of them. I'll let you take it from there if you're interested. Back to our regularly scheduled programming. So A and R are the analysts. Okay, They're the ones that are writing the research, and they're actually probably more important to your stock price because they are the ones that are telling the buy side what to do. And I'm paying them to tell me what to do. Now, they don't do a good, good job. I'm going to fire them. I'm going to hire somebody else. But there's 21 people covering Delta. Okay, So these are the people. They do two things. One, they all predict what Delta's stock price is going to be 12 months from today. That's called the target stock price. Helene's team updated that target stock price on August 30th. What is today? This morning. Her team said they think it's worth 60 in the next 12 months. Goldman, which updated theirs on August 16th, thinks Delta is only worth 51. It's slightly different opinions. What Bloomberg does, they take all these guesses and they average them out. Wisdom of the crowd. The average 12-month target stock price of the analyst today is 59.30. Delta, when I loaded the screen, was at 43.42, which suggests 36.6% upside in Delta stock in the next year. Through this morning, last 12 months, they were up 37%. You guys are doing a trading competition, which starts next Wednesday. Okay? When I'm looking for stocks, I want ones that can go up. Here's a potential stock that the analysts really like. Yes, sir? What's the buy size? Ticket? What's the what? Uh, HDS. All right, so that's one thing they do. Second thing they do is they write their buy, sell, hold opinions. Those are right here. Greens are buys. Yellows are holds. Reds are sells. Right? And the reason why they use green is because of marketing language. Like outperform means buy. You're going to do better than your peers. Uh, overweight doesn't mean fat. It means overweight your portfolio with Delta relative to other airlines or other stocks, which is another way for buy. Okay? All right, so here's the point. As of this morning, 20 of these people call Delta a long-term buy. Buys are worth five points. None of them say hold. Holds are worth three points. One says sell. Sells worth one point. On a five-point scale, Delta is a 4.76 out of five long-term. So next 12 months, 37% upside in the stock. Long-term, 4.8 out of five Delta. They really like Delta. Okay? I'm not saying it's a guarantee, but there's a stock that Wall Street thinks has a lot of upside. Okay? That's today. That's real time. All right? Now, how do they get these things? If I go to Helene this morning, her team writes research. They also have a coverage universe. The average coverage universe is between 10 to 15 companies. Okay? They select which companies they want to cover as a team. Now, her team covers 23. That's actually a much larger coverage universe, so they might have more than three analysts on that team just because it's a big team. Okay? But nonetheless, those are the companies, you know, those are all the airlines. They're specialists in the airline industry. And if you click on bio, you can see, same concept, there's Helene's bio including her little LinkedIn profile on the, the right, where she used to work. Like, she was at NYU, uh, Montclair. Uh, before Cowan, she worked at Jessup in Lamont as an analyst. There's her picture, blah, blah, blah. But back to this. Second screen is the research. They write research reports, which are the buy, sell, hold opinions, on what they think about Delta. All of her research is right here. When I click on research, that's where the research shows up. Does anybody know why my screen is blank? Why I'm not seeing the research for Cowan on Delta? I didn't pay for it. This is the $4 billion. This is how they make their money. 
So you pay for the research, they give you access to the research. You don't pay for the research, you don't see the research. Maryland subscribes to JP Morgan's research. So we get JP Morgan, we get Deutsche Bank, and one other. We don't get Goldman, we don't get Morgan Stanley, we don't get Cowan, so Bernstein, we, we aren't getting some of the research. We get a little bit of it. But that's how they make their money, right? <clears throat> and so back to this, the other thing they do, MODL, is they model out Delta's cash flows. This is the model, Excel models, forecasting Delta. This is a one-year view, single period. This is the multi-period view. What happens is, in single period, you can see this, they all upload their spreadsheets to Bloomberg. They're locked. If I click on this, it won't let me download this. It's going to say needs permission because you got to pay for it. So they have to give you the ability to download their spreadsheets that they've uploaded. This is how they sell their research. But they'll actually sell it to the They'll give it to the companies for free because they want Delta to help them comment on their models. But these are the actual models that they're using to forecast Delta. Okay? They're actually on Bloomberg. Now, they sell their models, but here's the one thing they all allow Bloomberg to do. Bloomberg aggregates their models. Okay? So the data in each of the models they have to pay for is aggregated in Bloomberg. That is done in a multi-period. So this is the forecast, which is called the consensus estimate, which is the average guess wisdom of the crowd. If I go a couple columns over, these are the next five years of what they're forecasting in their spreadsheets, averaged. So the average passenger mile, the average seat miles, load factors, revenue, cost, this is what they're forecasting in their models, which lead to the cash flows. In the interest of time, it's summarized on a screen called EEO. That's the screen we're going to use heavily this semester, which is the financial information that comes from the spreadsheets averaged. And this is called the consensus estimate database. This is what they think Delta is going to do for the next four years, and you click over more years than out. It's those revenues, profits, and free cash flows that lead to that share price. That's the baseline. Plus or minus a little bit. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? All right. Last thing I'll mention because I got two minutes left. One fourth cornerstone is competitive advantage. The key there is do you have a competitive advantage? We define how we're going to treat it. The other key is how long does it last? Darwin's at work, nothing lasts forever. We have to assess how long competitive advantages last. Okay? Now, between now and Wednesday, Monday is a holiday. Enjoy, have a safe, fun Labor Day holiday. When you come back next Wednesday, make sure by 10 a.m. you upload that screenshot. That's your homework assignment, right? And against my better judgment, I'm going to let you, relative to teams, select your own team. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to put a list of teams today called Section your 401, I believe. Section 401, Team 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It'll be blank. It is in Elms. It'll be in Elms under People. Okay? So here's what's going to happen. There's going to be the 180 people in the room. And you're going to see on the team list, you're going to see the teams for your section. Drag yourself to the team that you want to be on. So if you want to be on a team with a friend or whatever, you guys can kind of self-select the teams. But you've got to be on a team in the section you're registered for. So you have to be on a team, in your case, in section 401. All right? If you're not on a team on Wednesday, I will put you on a team. So don't feel pressure that you have to go select your own team. But if people want to work together, Now's your chance to self-select onto the team. So again, you will select your teams. Just quickly log in. Under the People tab of Elms. Sometimes the security just gets in the way. On the People tab of Elms, Fall 2023. Right here, people, project groups. All right, so there's 185 students registered. I'm going to create the groups. It'll be section 401 in your case, one, two, three, four, five, six. Just drag your name to that team. All right, and then that's it. Otherwise, have a safe and happy holiday. I'll see everybody next Wednesday. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, I have used it. Yeah, I was using it this summer. I didn't really like it. Actually. 